when I was still living in a, the, an at-risk metro housing area and I'm walking with a friend. We're walking home, school bags on and everything. We're actually coming back from the community center, playing basketball. It's summertime, I have shorts on and I have a white t-shirt. My friend's probably wearing track pants and a sweater. Both have our bags on, basketball bouncing in hand. And the police are driving down the street and then they see us and so they start to slow down. Driving behind us, but now they're driving slow, right? Already in our heads. Here we go again. This is what we're, here we go again, getting harassed again. All we're doing is walking from the gym with a basketball, going home, probably gonna play some video games, watch a movie or whatever. But now here we are, getting harassed again. The cops are behind us, driving slow. So now they pull up to the side of us, hop out the car. Where are you guys going? Where are you guys from? I live here, this is my name. This is where I'm going. Oh, apparently something happened 10 minutes drive away and we fit the profile. So now where are we from? Who, where are we going? Who are we? And it should be disturbing. In the, in the, in the eyes of somebody watching on the, on the outside, it's disturbing. You know, look how the police treat these guys. Look what they go through and I can't believe they're living like this. But in our eyes, it's like, it's normal. The first time it happens, you may be scared. The second time it happens, you may be, you know the drill, you can handle it. The third time it happens, like, oh, here we go again. By the time you get to the fifth, sixth, seventh time, you're agitated. I'm still a very calm, patient person. Could you imagine other people who aren't as patient? And this is where you get issues with people getting hurt or people getting arrested for no reason. Between 2008 and 2012, 1.8 million contact cards on over a million individuals. That's a lot of interactions that have been documented. They end up in a giant database. Uh, the vast majority of those interactions, there's nothing criminal happening, nothing at all. Uh, yet all of your personal details end up into this database. Who you're with when, when they stopped you, um, their suspicions, like what was the reason for the stop? Suspected gang activity. Well, maybe you're in an area where there's gang activity and they suspect you might be a gang member. Now, internally in that database, you're connected to a gang. and so. Uh, it's uh, pretty nefarious when you start thinking about what that database is. You look up on my contact cards, they, the police officers will say, oh, not police friendly. So now when you have an officer who wants to stop me for the next time, he's going to pull this up. And then it's, it's a total different interaction. It's not just police officer to, to citizen. It's more like possible threat. Some young men told me one night they're on the way to the convenience store and near their house two blocks away, they got stopped and interrogated for 10, 15 minutes. On the way back, they got stopped and interrogated for 15 minutes by two other police officers. Yeah. It's just like living in an occupied territory. Well, there's high crime areas, you might want to have more police officers there in order to have a presence that would prevent crime, maybe. Yeah. But why do they stop innocent people? They could just stand there. The problem facing the city of Toronto right now is what we would call a crisis of distrust or a question of the legitimacy of policing in a lot of neighborhoods in the city. It started back in 1957 as a suspect card where we take information on somebody who is a suspect and retain that information. It evolved since 1957 to present day or we'll go back to prior to July 1st this past year where we were in the practice of documenting every person that we spoke with taking their information, entering into a database. The argument from the police uh, uh, perspective um, is that if there is ever a crime that needs to be solved, you might have in an uh, internal database um, who this individual's associates were, so who the victim's associates were. People who are identified as black or African-Canadian 
um, consistently are three or four times more likely to be stopped, questioned, and searched by the police. To be clear, racial profiling by the Toronto Police Service and every other police service, racial profiling where an officer uses race as the primary or only reason to stop somebody and to carry out any other policing activity of an enforcement nature, it's wrong, it's illegal, it's immoral. Does it happen? Yeah, in an organization with 5,500 officers, policing that I've been involved with for 25 years, does it happen? Absolutely. Unfortunately right now, carding has come to mean anytime a cop stops and talks to me, I'm being racially profiled, I'm gonna be carded, and I'm, I'm being treated illegally. That's not the case. People break the law all the time. They speed, they park illegally, they, they jaywalk, they commit minor acts of criminality, they're involved in, in unlawful public uh, gatherings, and in any of those instances, a police officer may, may intervene. That's not carding, that's not racial profiling. That's police work, that's the work of public safety in, in, a, in a context like Toronto. In my view, where there is a power imbalance, which there is, and where there is a lack of information on the part of the person being stopped that they are free to go, I think we need to view that as a detention. And I would argue, and it's CCLA's position, that we need to view that as a detention. If the person feels psychologically constrained, and that is the court's definition for detention, and feels like they are not free to go, that is a detention. And certain rights should follow. A former police officer who had just left the service I was interviewing from him for some other purpose, and I just casually asked, you know, what do you know about carding? And then he proceeded to give me this, I believe, a, a frank, honest account of, from an officer's perspective, what carding is. So he described how it played a role in promotions, and if you don't have enough uh, contact cards, your supervisor may say, hey, platoon A got uh, 15 per officer, how come you, you only got 10? So then what the officers would do, he said, and himself included, was you, you'd go into a, a park, and look for people who aren't well-dressed and you just go in and harass them with the hope that once you ran their name through their database you would find that they had a previous contact and that would be the justification for the stop. I was going to pick up my 15-month daughter at that time and I was picking her up from my girlfriend's mom's house and she lives in like a priority neighborhood so I go there and it, it, it was the same kind of thing it was me and my girlfriend in the car there was cops already there that were driving out while I was driving in. And instead of them just continuing on their way, they had to stop, reverse, pull up behind me, come out, ask me to roll my window down, show my license, my, ins my insurance, all that stuff. And right away, I'm like, why? Like, what did I do? And they're like, well, we don't know if you're trespassing. We don't know that. And by the time that gets out, there's already two other cruisers coming blocking off the front and the side of my car. So I'm literally blocked in. And all this for what? Just to find out who I am and to find out my business there? This is the life, this is how life is. It's how it's supposed to be. Why? I don't know. It's just the way life is. This is the mindset of a person growing up having to deal with police harassment, police brutality, and just used to be having their rights abused. Now, anytime we see a police officer or something, the first thing that comes to mind, this guy's about to approach me on, on like some BS. Like obviously like you're probably there for a reason. I don't know what that reason is. So approach me with a reason. They should come with respect, just like if I was to go to them and ask them something or whatever, I'll, I'll treat them with respect. A simple, hi, how are you? That's a, an easy approach right there. And it doesn't happen. It's always don't move, da 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 da. Like who said I was gonna move? The communicating of where we started and where we ended up with carting is, uh, and important for, for both sides to understand. Uh, we need to understand the anxiety of the community of being in a database where our, our lens of putting people in the database aren't strictly to identify them as suspects or persons of interest. It was more or less to document the people that we had interaction with. I think the important question is, who's watching the police and how much information are they providing so that there can be proper accountability? And unfortunately, the only people who have been watching and monitoring and providing reports on data that is in police databases is the Toronto Star and it hasn't been an easy process for them. In the late 90s uh, we got interested in seeing what kinds of data the police actually kept on, on um, 
on arrest charges, interactions with the public. And we tried informally to get data, just you know, ask, asking, can you give us your database? They said, no. For seven years, the police uh, at every turn fought that request. Um, we had to go to court for it and eventually won access to the carding data. We analyzed it and it started showing the patterns that we suspected would, it would show that blacks were being uh, stopped disproportionately. And the discussion around this changed from one of denial to one of uh, acknowledgement. As a person who's uh, lived in the city of Toronto for, for almost 40 years and grown up in Scarborough as a young person of color, I was very much aware of this issue. I got three brothers. We all have our story to tell about Canada Board Agency, local Toronto police, policing in other parts of the world. So to be clear, I, I, there's nothing in the Toronto Star that surprised me statistically, anecdotally or anything else. Um, it just helped to put it into the mainstream conscious and, and good for them. So the Policing Literacy Initiative is a group of young leaders from all, all different neighborhoods across the city who came together to look at policing issues. And so the idea was that we met uh, twice a month for four months to study policing issues, uh, hear from different experts from uh, Toronto Police Services, the African Canadian Legal Clinic, uh, different community groups, academics and journalists to help us understand what was going on. When you think of policing, you think of guns, shooting, um, you think of raids, you think of um, racial profiling, you think of um, being stopped for no apparent reason. Typically when you're dealing with policing issues, you're dealing with people in social work, people that are criminal justice, people that are legal, or the police themselves. In this situation, you're dealing with people that just had a passion for helping people. I got involved with uh, the Policing Literacy Initiative and in the summer after attending a Trayvon Community Forum and I was extremely impressed by the vision they had and mobilizing a lot of the young members in the community to kind of tackle issues that we're currently facing in Toronto. In 2012, out of some 250,000 police community interactions, there were only 764 complaints made. Of those complaints, 395 were investigated and 369 were screamed out for whatever reasons. I looked at those numbers and I started asking, why is that so low? My gut feeling is that that 700 and, and whatever number of complaints are not due to the excellence of the performance of the Toronto Police Service, um, but instead because there are barriers. So I started talking to people about what barriers they encountered, whether it was just the first step of, I, I don't even know who I go and make a complaint to. A lot of people are still remain unaware of the existence of the OIPRD. Um, if people go, and I've heard this one a lot. Um, when people go into police stations to make complaints, they have very bad experiences with the front desk personnel. Um, they've already had a bad experience with police and then they're faced with an incredible level of rudeness and unhelpfulness or just not knowing what the process is. The way it's supposed to operate is simply you go to a police station and then you can tell them I have a formal complaint to make. Ideally, most of them would be trained or most of them would know what the process is. In many cases, this is not actually uh, the case. i had been studying carding for two months and uh, on uh, a late October night, I was outside of my apartment building on a phone with a colleague. At that point, I was approached by two Toronto police officers in their vehicle who had wanted to perform a street check to see what I'd been doing outside of my apartment. And I was in some ways living out the very things that we were th looking at in a theoretical way. I requested a mediated conversation. The uh, informal resolution process is uh, uh, just a way for citizens to have uh, essentially informal mediations with police officers that they have problems with. It's got a lot of potential to deal with a lot of the complaints that citizens have. They'll be able to just learn the viewpoint of the police officer. And it also helps because each individual police officer that undergoes the process, they themselves learn more about 
um, the way people react to certain things that they do. The mediated conversation occurred uh, about two months later and it was between myself and the two officers who stopped me on the street. And we had a great conversation. I was um, very, very pleased by the fact that they were well prepared to discuss the, pr the practices, the procedures. And I think that if it was used more often would make for better police community relations because it would force us to humanize each other a little bit more. As I started to read about disproportionate contact in Toronto, I came across some surprising facts like a Toronto Star article talking about how even with New York stop and frisk laws, you were more likely as a black teenager to be stopped in Toronto and carted in Toronto. And also that uh, these, a Sun News report talking about how blacks make up 2.5% of the population, but 9% of the population in federal prisons. And I also, looked into the uh, shooting of Sami Atim. And uh, I knew that there was public outrage, but uh, I knew that there, there might be a solution that came out of that incident because we all heard about Sami Atim because of a video, because someone in the public used their camera to shoot a video. And I wanted to explore the use of videos. So body-worn cameras refers to a policy that would see every Toronto police officer wear a camera on his or her collar and record their interactions with community members. And in my research, uh, I came across the 2012 study. The, the findings were pretty staggering. There's a decrease in 60% uh, in cases where there's a use of force and uh, complaints towards uh, police shot down 88%. When I saw that, I was like, how come Toronto police aren't using body-worn cameras? The ideal question that we're, we're pondering is, um, does community housing give too much power to the police services? So in the op-ed, we explored the ideal of being able to build something where residents engage together and they create an, uh, um, uh, uh, almost like a, a community watch. People who are not involved in planning and not involved in the process that's bringing safety to them typically don't feel safe to begin with. The general structure of a resident-led safety unit would be a mixture of uniformed and non-uniformed police. The uniformed police wouldn't consistently be in the community, but rather the non-uniformed community members would uh, patrol the community. Instead of using suppression tactics, these community members would be able to go about and engage uh, different residents in the community, con converse with them, ask them how their day is going, and I think this will build community, it will build trust. We were kind of focusing very strongly on the incident that happened in Neptune. Four teens, uh, known as the Neptune Four, up in um, Lawrence Heights neighborhood. They, uh, one evening when we're walking from their building in a TCHC a complex to a program, a mentoring program, and a Tavis uh, van rolls up unmarked, out come two officers, they start questioning these boys. Who are you, where are you going, show me some ID. So this one teen tried to exercise his rights and said, actually I'm not answering your questions, I'm gonna walk. And it, it resulted in a, in a violent takedown and a gun being drawn and pointed at these teens. So, uh, you know, you start hearing about this kind of thing happening, and this is, you know, you're walking in your own house, essentially. You know, this is their yard. They're, they haven't left the TCHC compound, and you're being asked, you know, about your business being there. And that kind of thing has really, uh, I think, uh, affected the public trust in the police. Identify key um, residents in the community who can take a leadership role and begin to roll out this ideal to key stakeholders outside of the communities. You're talking about agencies, you're talking, I'm talking about Toronto Public Health, Toronto Police Services, Toronto Community Housing. Say if there's a situation that, that goes into crisis, this residence uh, group now will have built a, a safety res response model where now you know when to call the police, police know who to connect when they get to the community. So all of a sudden, things become far more uh, interactive. But you also then have police coming in communities and doing policing. 
not coming into communities and doing the harassment pieces and the surveillance pieces. They're coming in with a defined purpose and that actually takes strain off of the police a little bit because if they're coming in doing all the other pieces, there's going to be a lot of finger pointing against them because they're doing a lot of wrong in that regards, right? I've been assigned to uh, PACER from the very infancy of March of 2012. It became clear that uh, the, the scope of the review needed to expand and we needed to tackle uh, a broader issue of bias and issues surrounding uh, uh, the sense of racial profiling. And so we have everything from individual officer training, evaluation and supervision to systemic changes, looking at all of our policy and procedures, looking at how we, how effectively or not so effectively we've educated our members and the broader community about what we do. It looks at te leveraging technology, like looking at body-worn cameras. It looks at information retention, privacy issues. We've taken a comprehensive review through 31 recommendations to make sure that we improve the effectiveness of individual officers. And more importantly, because the majority of the recommendations aren't geared around individual officers, they're geared around systemic changes better procedure, better policy, better record keeping, better retention, better supervision, better audits and controls. The second thing that I want to talk about is that the recommendations actually create more community oversight and community involvement in designing, evaluating and changing the system. We want to make sure that people understand, one, that they're free to leave and two, um, let's let them know why we're there and why we're saying hello. One of the patient rec recommendations is rewriting the procedure on who we card, why we card, and how we card. And so an officer is now going to have to articulate the reason why he needs to retain the information. Another portion of that new procedure is going to be um, accountability. The supervisor is going to have to look at that and agree with the fact that us retaining this information is going to lead to uh, community safety. We'll ask youth, for instance, um, you know, what do you think of the police? And they'll say, oh, I, I can't stand the police. I, I think they're corrupt. I think they treat people in my community unfairly. Uh, what do you think about the officer who's working in your school, for instance? Oh, that's a fantastic guy. You know, he plays basketball with us. He, I can go to him with, uh, uh, to discuss problems. Well, if you like this person, why don't you like the police? And a common response I'll get is, well, that's the public relations police. That's not the real police. The real police are the guys who roll around my community after 10 o'clock at night and stop and question and search me um, and treat me unfairly. Um, so the youth have often very sophisticated views of the police and are able to distinguish uh, between what they refer to as the social workers um, or public relations police and those that are involved uh, uh, heavily um, in police enforcement activities. You have an organization that wants to have, keep a positive face, but you got people behind the scenes that are causing havoc. And that havoc speaks louder than your mission statement. It's like, okay, in front of the camera, let's pretend it's our rainbow and sunshines, but once the cameras leave, let, 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 let's get back to the bullshit. I just really, I just hope you guys accomplish what you're actually trying to do. And I respect the fact that you guys are doing this because not a lot of people out there are doing it. Us as people and them as people, we wanted to sit down somehow and plan and just like make plans. Without the people, there's not going to be no change. The change has to start within us. I think at the very basic human level, we have to, uh, on a personal level, find ways to uh, understand what people's experiences may have been in their lives. Um, whether it's with, their, with the police directly here, whether it's their experiences uh, in, from where they came and find ways to uh, keep communication and dialogue going to build uh, higher levels of trust. If you have people that are growing up being harassed, they're growing up with this mental stigma that, okay, 
I'm looked at this way by society. In the eyes of the police, this is how I'm looked at. How is that person supposed to ever trust or work with the police at all? I can tell you that the most effective policing is a uniform officer who is known and respected in the community. And after a crime happens, it's the person you go to to say, who do you think could have been involved with it? Because they have the most rich and current information on what's going on. And when they're looking to solve a problem, not by way of enforcement, but by way of some sort of a community mobilization or crime prevention effort, can go to the right people in that neighborhood because they know the, the people of influence, the people who have access to resources, public spaces, funding, and they can go and contact those assets in the community and bring them into a problem solving situation. They owe it to the public to inform us about what they're doing, who they're stopping, and to date, we are not provided with the forms that they used to use, the questions that they're currently using, information about the databases that it's going to. And that's, that's information that is still missing from this discourse. And it's very important that, you know, that any data that is recorded by police, not that they should be recording data for this purpose, but any data that they are recording needs to be monitored and reviewed by a civilian oversight body because that's how we're going to know what is actually going on. How will you do something different that your predecessor hasn't already tried? And if you're doing something that we know that has been tried, that has been tested, then are you, do, are you really living up to your responsibility so that the next generation experiences policing and equality under the law in a different way? That's what we're all here for, I think, is to, is to get to that ultimate goal. And whether you're a police officer or you're a youth worker, you're a member of the community, uh, you're a deputy police chief, a Toronto Star reporter, uh, regardless of your role in this conversation, I think we all want to believe we have the same goal in mind. So remembering that we are all ideally on the same team and we're all ideally working towards the same goals and to hold each other accountable to actually pushing the needle and moving it forward so that we can say we've made a real contribution to this city, to these issues, to our country. That's our goal. When I look at uh, a group like PLI and I look at the people that came there, I look at people that say, no, it can change. You begin to identify champions on the police force who see policing from a different perspective and different angle from just the, 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 the surveillance aspect of it, from just the, the suppression aspect of it. That's how you begin to change it, by having champions within there who believe and connect with the community members and people of the community and people of greater communities to say, this is not right. We need to change them. And when they begin to say, yes, we need to change them as well, you begin to change it. trying to overtake it so i gotta fill the till with some motivation get a proper shield to seal what we growing lately there's a lot of ills to kill when you open daily get some pride of hills and wheels and we rolling baby it's that copper field concealed that we going crazy and the copper field we steal and we broken lazy so we shot a till to steal unloaded blazing it's like you're prone to defeat when you got a past record and you're known to police. Even if it's jaywalking, not chrome in the beaks, they still got an excuse to hold it and squeeze. Oh shit, another child gone in the inner city won't live that long.